guys give uh, kind of a summary of what you think went on in that discussion between Darth and Deacon Ananias, and we'll just kind of go from there. So, Jimmy, maybe you can start. Okay, yeah, I feel like my opinion will matter less. I got about an hour through the debate. The takeaway that I had were maybe like threefold. So on the one hand, it seemed like, Arianus, you think that there's certain dilemmas or conundrums in epistemology. And I think you mentioned uh, Agrippa's uh, Dilemma. problem. Yeah. yeah. So that, that was mentioned at one point. It sounded like uh, towards maybe an hour in where you seem to be driving at uh, Ananias is that you don't, you're not satisfied or you don't think there is a satisfying uh, answer to the problem of the criterion. So it seemed like you were taking the position of skepticism with respect to that. You know, traditionally, it's a, it's a trilemma. And I think there was some confusion about what Ananias was proposing as an alternative to what Chisholm presents. Because for Ananias, he had like this term, ultimate standard, and it seemed like you wanted to charge him with not being consistent about whether or not the modal property of necessity has important epistemic implications. But on the other hand, I don't think that he was really drawing on the mere modal necessity of his ultimate standard. I think he wanted to have a much more rich concept than that. Right. So a couple of things there. Number one, I do agree that um, the debate was posed in such a way where I was questioning him on sort of, you just said it, you said the word conundrum, these conundrums in epistemology, the problem of the criterion, uh, Agrippa's dilemma. And I was trying to figure out like what exactly would make it so that the Christian worldview could provide some sort of like solution to these problems. Number one, I think, I think after an hour in, I'm asking him about what would be the truth conditions for saying that God is the necessary precondition for logic. And he appeared to be like foundering about a little there because um, to just say that God would be the truth conditions for the very statement that God is the necessary precondition of intelligibility, right, isn't actually giving what I would call a grounding or some sort of explanation as to how he is the necessary precondition for intelligibility. You can't just repeat the thing that has to be explained as an explanation for the precondition of intelligibility, right? That's what he was doing. He was just confusing, um, let's just call it the datum, right? What has to be explained with um, the exponents, right? Presumably the things that would explain what has to be explained. And that was the first thing that I really thought made me like have some sort of intuition that he didn't understand what I meant by truth condition, but I wasn't going to hammer him down at the point so much. And then the other part was just this talk about like analyticity and whether or not we can guess we can get past all these issues with um, synonymy and some circularity of meaning and how exactly theism accounts for those issues much better than atheism would, or like any atheistic worldview would. Um, but I think you summed it up well for the most part. Yeah, I would say that's a good summary. Cool. So, I mean, I'm down to talk about any of those things. There was no, uh, there's no formal agreement for me on uh, what, what the topic of discussion is. But I think that like maybe, so if I had to propose something that's uh, gonna be a, as insightful as possible, I think the real trouble here might be that there's some misunderstandings about what God is doing in Ananias's metaphysics. And I can't, I'm not, I'm not Eastern Orthodox, so I can't pretend to be um, a representative of his view, but I can say some things um, 
about uh, Christendom over the years, and I can say some things, I, I can maybe give something of a metaphysical story that shows, oh, okay, so look, there's this, there's this God character, and he has this nature, and that's, uh, on the one hand, why it's not really, it's not appropriate to think that something like the mere necessity of a truth or the mere necessity of a fact is what's explaining um, our warrant to believe it or our warrant to think that it's uh, epistemically necessary or something like that. Um, and on the other hand, I think it would just go to show that like, look, th this is a story that's not open to atheism. So it leaves us scratching our head like, what does the atheist have to offer that you know, if we're if we're going to use one of these conundrums as a foil, that gets around the conundrum. Well, I mean, the the issue with the you said several things there. Number one, you said warrant for epistemic necessity. I think, and and Anais made it very clear that he was appealing to epistemic necessity because he starts off with God as he starts off with God as like the justification criteria for all of our justification criteria. That's how he puts it. So the fact that, you know, I know God exists, right? He wants to argue that I know God exists. Um, that's just to say that given all the facts I know, um, God, it's true that God exists. Um, so then I pressed him on several points. I was trying to investigate what exactly would constitute the moral property sorry the modal property of necessity when saying that god is necessary um like obviously you're aware well aware of what it means to say that god god has certain properties which are coextensive with um properties about his intellect or properties about the good um i didn't get a satisfactory answer from that like what exactly would constitute those modal properties maybe you can help me tell tell me what exactly what properties are coextensive there other issues i think that ananias could have i mean he elucidated quite well but i thought he could have done better was to like explain how all the atheist alternatives um without running some version of like presuppositionalism which I'm sure you're fond of what exactly would make it so that his view provides some sort of theoretical virtue that the atheist worldview doesn't have, because it seems to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, for any intentional property that you want to predicate upon this God and say that these intentional properties serve as the necessary precondition for intelligibility, I can equally as well replace all of that with talk of dispositions and just say, look, um, it's nomologically necessary that um, somehow the necessary natural objects, right, in reality, let's just say the initial conditions of natural reality, happens to have the causal disposition out of nomological necessity to imbue me with the knowledge necessary um, for my ultimate starting points. And it seems to me like when we compare the two worldviews, yours versus mine, um, really, it seems to me like there's just going to be some sort of just so story that we're going to both fall into. It's just that yours is just going to suffer from ontological profligacy at a massive scale. And mine, given the principle of parsimony, is just going to turn out better on almost every theoretical front. And second of all, um, if we go by the principle of parsimony anyway, I don't know how sympathetic you are. We could talk about other principles if you want. It seems to me it's more likely, um, given all my background information, that some view that I ultimately don't even agree with but can take up for this discussion like naturalism is more likely to be true than theism. Now, you might contest and say, well, look, probabilities isn't like the best way to like approach the issue of theism. And in some respect, you're right. There are some holes to probability, which I think don't apply to like my full critique of theism anyway. 
but it's certainly one advantage that I see in the view. And the second advantage I, I see in the view is that for any modal property that I posit to some natural thing, right, when I say that X natural property happens to be nomologically necessary, and that property imbues me with knowledge in some dispositionalist account, it seems to me like you want to run some sort of like evolutionary argument against naturalism. And you want to say that if naturalism in conjunction with evolution is true, then most of my beliefs select for survival um, rather than truth. Um, and that's just because the underlying things, the underlying things under naturalism that would falter my knowledge would just be that it comes from a fallible source, right? Um, and you really can't get like knowledge on that kind of view if it comes from a fallible source. Now, the reason why I think most of the ar arguments like this one are going to be very ludicrous is that number one, they're going to assume various things that probably the naturalist wouldn't accept. Number one, it seems to presuppose some sort of like correspondence theory of truth, right? That there's a world out there which presumably is going to be represented in such a way that's going to be independent of my epistemic notions, right? Or what I would call my beliefs. And second of all, it also seems like this view makes a presumption that if something comes from a fallible source, it must be, for the most part, unreliable. Um, I don't see any direct entailments which would persuade me into believing that. But nevertheless, you might go with that argument, I guess. Number three, it seems to me like um, you um, under this view, for the most part, you wouldn't um, take a naturalist seriously if they were to be something like a direct realist. But also, you would have to make an argument as to why you think naturalism in conjunction with evolution, natural selection is going to undercut um, direct realism, right? Um, and fourth, when talking about alternatives to theism, right, which don't have to do with naturalism, have to do with some Platonistic view, um, I just, I've never encountered any such good arguments. In fact, one argument which I think Ananias could have brought up against Platonism as a possible, possible alternative to theism he could have just brought up some sort of like coincidence objection that if these objects are causally inert, then, you know, in what sense do we know that they exist if they don't interact with our epistemic notions? Um, he didn't bring that at all. So to cut it short, I really think that in Ananias, while, you know, he really pressed down the points several times in that discussion, he could have expanded way more and I still think that up to this day, his critique doesn't stand against any of the points that I've raised now. Okay, so, wow, there's a lot there. Um, we, might have to, we might have to come back to some stuff you just said, but to maybe try to bite onto what you put there. The juiciest part I see in what you're saying is you think that there is some kind of, um, it's, almost, it's almost like an, it's almost analogous to an underdetermination problem. You, you see that there are sort of provisional ad hoc stories that can solve the problem of the criterion or maybe some other uh, epistemological conundrum. But the nature of these different stories is such that there's no reason to prefer uh, Christianity's metaphysics. And the um, part I'm in the dark about is the, um, the supposition that's made there that there can be uh, known provisional stories or that we can know, for example, that like you could, you could possibly be a direct realist about naturalism uh, or that you could be a Platonist or anything like this if you don't already possess that actual story in virtue which 
the conundrum is solved and knowledge for you obtains. It seems like this just kind of gets ahead of ourselves and supposes that we've solved the problem in order to then postulate what things then uh, could solve the problem. But it seems like you would already need the specific answer that does the job. Or maybe you think that uh, there's some kind of shared property uh, of these stories or something like there's some shared content that's basic that solves uh, the problem of the criterion. Well, but, first, but I think. Well, the shared property between the views that I've just offered and what you just said is that both of our theories are going to have it built in, built into our theory that merely all of these um, epistemic conundrums and problems are going to be explained when we appeal to some metaphysical ultimate. Under your view, um, this metaphysical ultimate is intentional. Under my view, uh, this metaphysical ultimate is dispositional. Now, a good question to ask you is what sort of um, epistemic property, right, are you going to appeal to in order to say that under your view, there's some advantage when it comes to how I come to be warranted in my beliefs versus the view that I just offered, which was just purely dispositional. Like, what about a non-dispositionalist account makes it much more easy and less superfluous for an agent to gain knowledge than under my view? I guess someone would have to defend a very uh, controversial theory of mine to say that something like the kind of natural phenomena we have first-person experience of is the same category of objects that could be metaphysically ultimate. It doesn't need to be a mind or something like another person that we know. It seems to me you've got to make a, a very strong case about what we, even though we don't expect the same things out of coffee cups, we don't expect the same things out of stars exploding, we don't expect the same things out of diseases and neurosis and uh, uh, the brain synapses going off when someone is confused. We don't expect the same things of those and we don't use them as explanatory right. tools the same way that we talk about people and we appeal to other human beings. So it seems like you'd have a very uh, important metaphysical insight to give us about how these things even could be interchangeable. Right, but but to be clear, like I'm just asking you what, like, what when you say that those things are presumably, you want to make the claim that those things are presumably going to be better grounded under theism, or maybe you have some different notion of grounding there that has to be cast out in explanations versus the view that I just offered, are you going to appeal to anything in the causal or infer inferential relatum to say that under um, theism, the reason why um, we can appeal to these things, like we say that we have knowledge, for example, we have justified true beliefs, is that under theism, if the process were to be dispositional and naturalistic, then we can never gain mostly true beliefs. In fact, under naturalism, there's going to be a wide epistemic defeater for most of our beliefs, whereas under theism, it's much narrower, right? Um, so I'm asking you, like, how exactly are you going to infer from theism that um, all these epistemic problems that you've just laid out, which I agree with you that those things are also going to be epistemic problems, that the content of which our beliefs are mutually shared, that those beliefs are going to be, um, let's just say, they're going to run less issues with all the skeptical challenges than atheism, right? What, what, what property does theism has that atheism doesn't where you could appeal to theism and just say, well, under theism, we're mostly safe from these skeptical objections and scenarios that are posed right? Um, because I think that they appear to be logically coherent and applicable to both views. So what I'm trying to get a picture of is, like, 
what presumably what property does theism have that atheism doesn't in order to resolve these skeptical challenges? Yeah, so I think I think I was sort of trying to give you that maybe to um, be more blunt about it. Uh, minds just aren't like things in the world of, of uh, natural phenomena. This uh, alternative to Christianity depends on saying that they are so comparable. So it's been falsified. Well, uh, they say, what, that, say that first part, minds aren't part of the natural phenomena? No, I said they're not comparable with respect to what our expectations epistemologically and how we use them to explain certain knowledge transactions. Uh, so let, would... me, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Okay, I think it's, I think a way to sort of think of um, this manner of approaching um, views about God, where his status as God and his revelatory work in creation, especially uh, his son sending the Holy Spirit and coming down to reveal the Father. Um, alternatives to that view, I think, are kind of like two people uh, having a disagreement about who they should trust. One person says, hey, look, this, this Jesus character over here, he's God, and he saved me from my sins. So that makes him a more reliable authority than anything else I can possibly appeal to. He's, he's uh, the best source I've got to go on. In fact, his deity makes him not only maximally reliable, but makes him self-sufficiently reliable. That is to say that his testimony about something is just a sufficient reason to believe it in itself. No further uh, condition needs be met. Uh, and another person says, well, but I've got Joe over here. I've got Joe's testimony that what Jesus says isn't in fact true, at least, you know, not about his whole being God thing. And what is it about Joe uh, that makes him different than Jesus? And I say, well, OK, a, a couple things, right? Joe has fooled you quite a few times. You know, Joe, Joe has lied to you. He's caused you to believe some things that are false. Um, Joe himself doesn't know everything about the world, so it'd be a little confusing to compare him to a God that does. Uh, right, we can go on and on. It just, there's a, there's a bit of, uh, I have to admit, it's so intuitive to me, and I think it's so intuitive to most people that um, this God character of the Bible is not like a tree. Uh, it's a little different to say this tree somehow explains my ability to know things and to be a cognitive entity, an agent running around in the world. Then it is to say this God character, who's a person like I am, who talks like I do, who came down in human form. Right? You know, you can give all these these properties to establish it, but I. But the reason why. I made this uh, point about, hey, there's this controversial claim that's being made that these are even comparable in the first place. If you go to defend that, if you go to show me like where you think these are basically compatible, then I think it will be more available to us why this shouldn't be intuitive or why it's not obviously clear that to anyone who just considers it, that God can't be replaced with natural phenomena. But it seems to me enough to say, Natural phenomena has fooled you before. It's we don't think that uh, having a brain is a sufficient condition of having knowledge about any particular claim, particularly naturalism. So, why would we think that the brain is sufficient to account for all knowledge, or right. you know, something like that? A couple of things there. Number one, you said something about minds not being comparable. The thing is, is that I can even grant you that minds aren't comparable and that's somehow compatible with the atheistic hypothesis I laid out earlier. Um, so I don't see how your point was really relevant to what I was saying earlier. And second can of I, all, can I ask, 
well, just let me finish. And second of all, um, you seem to be running on this presumption where um, the more I make claims about like my system or what my system was designed to explain to begin with, like the fact that God has imbued me with knowledge, for example, of his existence and the fact that these things ap appear to be intuitively obvious, right, to the normal person, like the average person that God can't be replaced with natural phenomena. I mean, how isn't, you gave some sort of reason, right? You said that the average person can just ask, well, why would anyone believe that the brain is some sort of sufficient condition for coming to grasp at these things? Well, I mean, I don't see how the same, because this, this isn't answering what I asked you earlier. When I asked you earlier, what property, um, what property does theism have, the theistic hypothesis has, that the atheistic one doesn't have at explaining or accounting for why we have knowledge to begin with, you just gave me, like, you just gave me what the claims that your thesis presumably is designed to make, which I'm not interested in, right? Um, it, it just it appears that you're not giving me any source of like independent corroboration. Now, from my view, from my perspective, everything that you just said about God being the metaphysically ultimate or God being the ultimate referent or whatever you said, I could just, I, I just don't see why I couldn't just replace that sort of talk with talk about natural dispositions, right? I find it intuitively obvious that when I look around in nature, I mean, I come to the conclusion that God cannot replace natural phenomena, right? So presumably, this is why I'm asking you now, what would be the symmetry breaker and what I just said and what you just said, right, earlier? So, yeah, I, I don't know what the first point was because I don't know what, what's attached to the pronoun. When, when you said that um, I didn't answer the question earlier, could you maybe rephrase that, uh, you know, expand on what you're, what you're referring to? The reason why we would have less, less good reason to believe in naturalism was because minds, or let's just say atheism more broadly, um, the reason why we have less reason to believe in that is that your first point was that minds aren't comparable. That's what you said. And I'm like, well, even if I were to like grant you that, that's still consistent with the atheistic hypothesis and denying Christianity, denying your view, right? So, I mean, I don't see how I see. denying the compare. Okay, that was the first part. The yeah. second part... The well, second part. Quick, I want to. I want to respond to this. No, no, no. I, just, just let me finish. The second part was you, just, um, I mean, in other terms, just explaining how you would encounter these things to be more intuitive than naturalism by appealing to God's necessity and appealing to the fact that there is this maximally great agent, right, that imbued you with knowledge, and. I asked you the question, well, how, why would we have any reason to believe that it's intuitively obvious under your view or in most people's conception that God um, is irreplaceable? Not even natural phenomena can replace God. And me just saying, me pointing to some metaphysical ultimate reference, right? Like the initial conditions of natural reality and appealing to the causal dispositions of those initial conditions. And then me saying, well, it's intuitively obvious to me that no one can replace the initial conditions of natural reality. And then I asked you, well, what's the symmetry breaker between what I just said there and what you just said earlier, right? So I think there's a lot of confusion about what I'm actually saying, but, but really quick. So I think your first point is just kind of to uh, unintentionally shift the goalpost. Uh, where we were at in the conversation I, was I yeah. raised the challenge as to how someone could see that God is possibly replaceable. What justifies the claim 
that God is replaceable, full stop. And what was brought to the table was naturalism. So the goal of naturalism in the conversation, the, the role that it was playing, was not to give an example of a supposition that atheism is already possible. Rather, it was to exemplify justification for the belief that atheism is possible. So now by showing it by giving objections to naturalism, I'm giving objections to that article in the conversation, which is aimed at justifying atheism. So if, the, if these objections succeed, then they succeed in showing that atheism is not possible. Remember, the, the, whole, the whole disagreement between Christians and Christians is whether unbelief is even a rational alternative whatsoever. Which means, you know, for the, for the sake of this conversation, I'm not granting that uh, it's possible for the naturalist to come up with these alternatives. It's on his shoulders to demonstrate that that's a reasonable alternative. Now, I think you misunderstood the, my appeal, my, my response to naturalism in the first place, why God is different. I, I don't think I even used the word necessity. So I'm a little confused as to how, as to why you would think that I was appealing to his necessity. And I'm a little confused about that. But what I actually said was that, look, um, people and how they reason about the world already work off of the distinction between persons and natural phenomena. We do not confuse rocks with people. And when someone does, we consider that a psychological problem. You, now, you are welcome to defend an alternative thesis. You could just say, you know, you could be an eliminativist and say, you know, people just are um, complex clocks. That's fine if, if you want to go that route. I think that's rather, I, I take it that that's rather unpopular, and I don't think you want the burden of defending such a ludicrous thesis. But you are welcome to do so. But in the meantime, pe people already work under the distinction between agents. In fact, you yourself just use that word to individuate God, to distinguish God, in my hypothesis, in my worldview rather, from natural phenomena. You said there's this agent, this, ma this uh, ultimate agent. Right, exactly. And that's a distinction we already have in common with our worldviews. What the naturalist wishes to say is that there are these non-agents. There are these non-persons. In fact, reality at bottom is impersonal. Well, that's very easy to knock over. All I have to do is point out that, hey, as a matter of a track record, all of the impersonal objects in the universe are not disposed whatsoever to giving you knowledge. Okay, there, there's nothing that you can point to which has explanatory power over your cognition. That is a made-up fairy tale. That is the equivalent of druids going into the outlands, putting some rocks together and saying, this is the ultimate reality. Now you, again, you are welcome to defend the claim that they are comparable, but I'm just saying, hey, so far I think the objection is sufficient to say, uh, when people give us reports of what's true, we can, uh, judge whether they're more or less reliable. We have a track record that we can go off of, and we can look at the human race and say, hey, these are people that we can understand. I don't know what it would even mean to say, this tree is revealing to me knowledge or, or something like that. You know, like you, you described yourself having the intuition, and, I, and I, I'm not sure whether you wanted that to be treated as an intuition or as an argument, because you mentioned that it was an inference. No, but well, described, no, no, it just seems you, so you misunderstood. You described, hold on, you hold on. You described, well, let me finish. You described yourself as having this, I, I, it sounded to me like an epiphany, of having this epiphany that um, nature, these things in, in the natural world, can be independent of God. Okay, but that's not to say that they play an explanatory role, that they are somehow causally significant to the occurrence of that knowledge. And that's precisely the account that the naturalist needs to put forward. He needs to show how, in principle, things in the natural order 
could explain how we are cognitive beings. I don't think that I don't think even prior to the time of evolutionary biology, a single theory of that sort has ever been put forward. They're very easy to knock over. Yeah, so I, I think you misinterpreted my intuition. When I said that I could just equally say that I have this intuition um, that nature is irreplaceable and not even God can replace it, I was mirroring your claim, which you failed to even answer my previous question when I asked you what property presumably does the theistic hypothesis have which would explain how um, theism would get out of most skeptical scenarios that are posed against that view over naturalism. You never answered that. And second of all, you seem to make this like weird presumption that you seem to make, sorry, I was about to get a call. You seem to make this weird presumption that um, for the totality of most fixed objects under naturalism, because they are impersonal, they cannot imbue you with knowledge because there's no disposition from which those natural objects could imbue you with knowledge. But you see, I was making the claim that they would imbue you with knowledge. And your response to that is presumably what would justify the naturalist in believing so? And I just gave you the example earlier. The justification would be is that I'm just going to explain it given my hypothesis. And um, in my hypothesis, presumably, I'm just going to give the same just so story that you've given by appealing to instead of this talk about God's intentions and whatever he wants to intend for his agents to know he imbues them with that knowledge. I can just replace that with dispositional talk. And it seems to me that it appears logically consistent and nomologically possible to say that dispositional states, uh, presumably these like natural objects, dispose me to know things. And you said that that could happen. Sorry, sorry, don't interrupt me. And you said, you said that that couldn't happen because those things don't have agency. Now, the weird thing here is, is that you actually didn't even provide an argument for why things in nature wouldn't have the disposition to imbue you with knowledge. You just said that they wouldn't, which I'm just going to take it that in this dialectical context, what you've just done is to negate my claim without any justification for your claim, right? So that's already strike one off the bat. And strike two, there's this like weird presumption. I don't know where you get this from, where if something is naturalistic, right, it's not going to be the case that you wouldn't ever find agency or other like talk about an agent's intentions emerge out of naturalistic states. Like that's odd, right? Like why would we have any reason to believe in what you're saying without you just like being incredulous about what the naturalist has to say about the. Yeah. Okay. So uh, towards progress in the conversation, uh, do we agree then that your original uh, point one that I responded to just recently, uh, do, you, do you concede that that was successfully put to rest? That to expect me to engage atheism in abstract as if we're granting that in the conversation when rather the purpose of discussing naturalism is that the role it plays is to justify the possibility of atheism. So, no, you didn't, because I asked you exactly how would you examine, right, atheism simpliciter in such a way where my atheistic view is just going to vastly undercut the content of my knowledge in comparison to yours. Now, when you gave your just so story and you thought that just repeating what the thesis is designed to explain, right, as some sort of justification for why you have a reliable belief forming process, when I mirrored that, right, and I took that into some naturalistic view, this naturalistic view, which has to do with natural objects disposing you of knowledge, 
And then you come in and say, well, I just don't see how you would be disposed uh, to have knowledge under that view, because I just take it that natural objects wouldn't have that disposition, right? I'm doing the same exact thing as you did, right? The whole point is, is that you don't have any justification independent of your just so stories. In fact, you never provided any piece of independent corroboration, which would sway me to believe that under theism, most agents are just going to have mostly true beliefs. That was never explained. That was never explained without appealing back to theism. So when I do the same thing for naturalism, and I just appeal to these like dispositional states, which imbue me with knowledge, you somehow criticize me because I'm presumably not going to be justified. Well, by your own standards, I would be justified because I just offered a just so story, no piece of independent corroboration offered, and I still gave an account under your own lights by account, right? In terms of this discussion, I gave an account as to how I would be imbued with knowledge. And you just saying no, you just negating that and just saying that, look, under naturalism, those things wouldn't have the disposition to imbue, imbue me with knowledge, isn't giving me some sort of reason that would persuade me out of the view. In fact, the reasons that you just provided throughout this discussion so far are just going to be parasitic on your conclusion that theism is the case. And that's the thing in question. And the second part is that you apparently didn't give an accurate answer when I asked you, well, um, how is it the case that theism simpliciter is going to run these um, arguments like the evolutionary argument against naturalism and other such arguments without presupposing certain things like, I think I said direct realism or a correspondence theory of truth. Like why does a naturalist have to accept those things, those sort of assumptions that you were making in your original argument? And you didn't give an answer to that either, right? So I don't see what progress we're making in this discussion. I think most of that is uh, a projection of your confusion about what I've said, but toward progress, right? Let's stick with one point at a time, right? So uh, earlier in the conversation, you said that I hadn't answered some questions, and I think that was for you to confuse the role that atheism is playing in this discussion. So I just want to get it straight, and I'm, I don't think it's worthy of further... Uh, blustering about what you think I've done in errors regarding the other points. Right now, I just want to get this point underway. Uh, do you concede that the role in this discussion that atheism is playing, or excuse me, that naturalism is playing, is to justify the claim that atheism is possible? If you disagree, then we need to hammer that out because it seems like you want to say that these are all provisional. Um, accounts that would answer the problem of the criterion, but I'm not willing to grant their possibility until you presented an actual, not a provisional, but the account you are genuinely operating on in order to have an answer to the problem of the criterion, in order to then understand and reason about what kinds of properties these other views could even share with your own and say that they are provisional answers, right? It seems like we're getting way ahead of ourselves about what the problem of the criterion even is. It seems like you're not respecting how big an issue it really is when you just take for granted that these other views are possible instead of establishing that they are. So again, um, I just, I, so let me just ask you this question, right? Um, if I told you that my reason for believing that um, your your hypothesis is replaceable and that atheism appears to give a solid account um, as to how I would be justified, let me just ask you these sets of questions, right? Number one, um, when you say that you're justified in my in you're justified in your beliefs, right? It appears like earlier you were assuming some sort of like internalist thesis of knowledge, which, I mean, I don't see why I should accept that. Number two, 
right? Like, why isn't a sufficient answer to just say that atheism appears to be logically possible and epistemically possible? Because I just take it that atheism is logically possible. And um, we could talk exclusively about, like, the processes in which I would be imbued with knowledge under naturalism, but you didn't seem to give some sort of account of justification at all in this discussion. It just seems like you want to shift it back to my position. And you never answered my questions, my original questions. So I don't think I would let you off the hook on those. You explicitly granted that uh, Christianity solves the problem of the criterion. So that's I did. why I didn't think it was... I grant that. When did I grant that? I said that... I said that whatever you could appeal to in your worldview in order to quote unquote justify how you have knowledge, justification, which examining your speech acts, how you've like behaved in this discussion seems to assume that you could just blabber on about the hypothesis without giving any piece of independent corroboration as to how you would be justified over believing anything. I said that I could just take that, mirror it under naturalism, and you didn't give any sort of defeater as to what I said without just negating every single one of my claims, right? When I said that I was disposed to have knowledge, all you did was, well, I mean, I just don't see the reason why anyone should believe that natural objects have the disposition to imbue with imbue you with knowledge because those natural objects don't have the disposition to imbue you with knowledge, right? So I'm just going to examine that speech act in this discussion as you just engaging in some question begging response, which I don't accept. And obviously your form of fallacious reasoning isn't going to count in favor of you having any justified true beliefs over your view, right? So like, why are you coming at me with the problem of the criterion, which I don't even think that you can get off the ground with the problem of the criterion, because I asked you specifically earlier, what property does theism have, right? Which would make it so that most of the skeptical scenarios would dissipate under theism and not under atheism. And you didn't give a response to that, right? Like this is the fourth time of me repeating this. Yeah, so uh, three things really quick. First, yeah, I've, I've already explained that I don't think it's worthwhile uh, going through the weeds of your confusion about my answer until we've gotten an agreement about what that answer is supposed to be doing, namely showing that the example of naturalism that you've claimed is possible uh, is impossible but or something like that. Let me just ask you this. Now, let me just ask you. No, hold on. Let me just go back hold to on. earlier. Number. Let so my go, second point. Let me my go second to the point. Original point. My second point. My second point is that. Let's see if I let's see if I can remember being interrupted. Uh, yeah. So my second point is that look, uh, at the very beginning of this conversation, I thought it was insightful, and it's turning out to be, to ask you the question. Uh, or to um, lay out as a foil, that is to give you an autobiographical report, what position I thought you were taking in order for you to clarify where you stand with respect to the problem of the criterion. And I said, it seems like Arianus is uh, in the position of the skeptic. Is, right? Now, right. The, the reason I brought that up was because what stance you take on the problem of the criterion has all matter of gravitas for our discussion about how you justify things, how you give an explanatory story of something, um, what, what something like an account or a worldview or a hypothesis or any of those things are, right? That's, that's going to have fundamental entailments on that discussion. And that's why I was asking. I took it to be. You know, and you can just say, hey, this wasn't obvious to me, and that's fine. But I just took it to be granted that I take a Christian position. You said that I was fond of presuppositionalism. You know, I don't like the term. But, yeah, like I, I, take, a, I take a Vantilian view of philosophical matters. Uh, last thing really quick. Look, we're, 
it's not worth pursuing the question about the difference between mind and matter, the difference between uh, nat uh, the explanatory and epistemic reasoning that we privilege minds with over against natural phenomena if you don't even think that naturalism is playing the crucial role of justifying the possibility of atheism. If you're working under the mistaken and question-begging assumption that atheism is possible, and all you have to do is provide an example, then we have a more meta concern, which is, look, you haven't established that atheism is possible in the first place. And the only way to do so, it seems to me, you're, you're welcome to disagree and provide some alternative account. But the only way I can explain how one would go about showing the possibility of atheism is by showing the necessary and sufficient conditions of knowledge that they do not include something like Christian revelation or that they do not believe, include theism or you know some such, right? But that's just going to mean giving a concrete account. It will not do, it will not be sufficient to treat these various Platonisms and non-Christian theisms and, and other alternatives to Christianity as provisional alternatives if it hasn't been shown in the first place that you can have a provisional alternative. I am happy to move to critiquing the one you've presented, but not if we're just going to have this continued con circular confusion that we have to come back to where you lose track of the fact that you need to establish it was possible in the first place. Yeah, so this, again, so two things there. Number one, right, um, you haven't provided any sort of logical defeater for why atheism could be the case, right? I mean, if we're just, I mean, you weren't also clear with your language when you said that the possibility of atheism. Um, so let me just clarify with you right now. So. When you say possibility of atheism, are you just talking about a more broad logical modality, like logical possibility? Or are you talking about metaphysical possibility, whatever that means, doxastic possibility, epistemic possibility? Like what modality is the thing in question? That's the first question. Number two, why would we have any reason to think that just a narrow version of theism right, is going to be a solution to the problem of the criterion. I pretty much gave you my position earlier that I was going to be a skeptic on the issue. How exactly is perfectly consistent, right, that theism is true and the problem of the criterion hasn't been resolved, right? If we even assume that under your view, you have solved anything because all you gave was just more ju uh, claims about justification that your view is designed to explain in the same way that when I offered my view earlier of naturalism, right, my naturalistic view was designed to explain that I didn't have to make any sort of presumptions that would require independent corroboration like you did. Right. That's the first one. The second part is um, you seem to when you when you ask a lot about like what my reliable, what my belief process would be and how I would attain justification just seems like earlier you were assuming some internalist view that you didn't give an argument for. And, number, and the last part would just be the fact that, I mean, what, what set of conjunction of two inconsistent propositions are you going to derive in order to justify your claim that atheism is logically impossible? Right. If that's what you mean by impossible, when you say that atheism is impossible, well, atheism wouldn't entail such a conjunction, right? Like, how would be how would it, how would it be entailed from the fact that God doesn't exist that um, that conjunction wouldn't stand, right? And um, another point of confusion here. Sorry, I'm outside. Another point of confusion here is this whole talk about. Um, again, the problem of the criterion and how those things are going to be solved under your version of theism, right? When I just told you that it's perfectly consistent that 
theism is true and that issue isn't resolved, then most of these epistemic conundrums that you were bringing out earlier aren't going to be resolved either. So we really haven't been offering anything up to the table. To be fair, um, I've offered as much as you have, but with like less assumptions, right? I didn't have to assume internalism. I didn't have to assume that naturalism is going to provide some like defeater for like the problem of the criterion. That's just ridiculous. And the last point is it appears like um, I don't think you actually understand what justification would even be right outside of outside of internalism. It seems like you haven't read up on like other views regarding justification, which isn't just yours. Yeah, so a couple of things there. So I think you wanted to ask me a few questions at the beginning. Can, can you repeat those? And I'll try to give you my best answers. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, what I'm saying is you, you laid out so much, you're going to have to repeat the, the, so I think there was like two, maybe oh, three sorry, questions. Sorry, at the sorry. Um, yeah, I'm a bit distracted outside. So like, the first issue is you've made some like insane claim. Uh, I mean, I don't mean to be rude that Christianity provides some sort of like solution to the problem of the criterion. Like, I don't see how that's even going to work, but let's, I'm going to put my faith in my epistemic peer here so he could do it. And the second part is um, there also seems to be the sort of like presumption that you were making earlier, which seems to align with internalism, right? Um, I don't see any reason for why should I accept that. And then the third part was um, you making this like this claim about necessary and sufficient conditions and how we would attain knowledge under theism. I mean, I'm not usually a fan of like necessary and sufficient conditions talk here, but besides the point, um, I mean, how is that? I mean, the sufficient conditions, it just seems like those would be vastly underdetermined by at least your version of theism, if not general theism. I don't see how you could give a sufficient account for that without making more assumptions that you've added in. Like when I asked you earlier, um, what would be the sort of property that you're going to appeal to that the theistic theory has in order to undermine um, most skeptical scenarios? Um, you just gave me a bunch of claims that your thesis is designed to get out of, right? And I could do the same thing for my view. And you didn't give an answer to that other than just having this like incredulous stare at how exactly I would be able to gain a reliable belief forming process under naturalism, given my dispositionalist account. Um, that, uh, real those quick, are like the real, main problems. Real quick here, guys, we've been going for about an hour. And uh, I think this first hour, you guys have had kind of pretty long volleys back and forth. So maybe uh, as we continue into a second hour here, let, let's try to keep the volleys short, you know, maybe under a minute as we go back and forth, just in uh, hopes of progressing here. Yeah, I think I, I think the last point there, Arianus, was a uh, was more of an argument than a question, but like, or, or maybe you could consider it a challenge at, at best, but like, Toward what uh, Truthy just said, uh, <laughs> I want to answer your questions, bro, but I can't remember them. If, if uh, there's a lot of complicated issues you're bringing up in each one, so let's try to take these one by one. Um, it, so I'm I'm gonna lay down my hands. Look, right? like, gonna... I repeat it for you very quickly. So let let's Go just write down on like if you have a notepad or type it up somewhere if you're on your computer. Number one, right? It would just be your claim that atheism is logically impossible, right? Or that atheism is logically inconsistent. Well, if that were true, then somehow theism would be some theorem of logic. But since theism isn't a theorem of logic, therefore atheism cannot be logically impossible. In fact, atheism is logically possible. Um, second of all, 
um, I wanted to investigate this claim that you made about um, Christianity being some sort of like solution, Christianity being some sort of solution to the problem of the criteria. Yeah, that was right. your question. That, 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 was, that was more of like a question. Uh, the first one was an argument. And then the third one has to be like th how you, th th this like, this arg well, I don't think you gave an argument, but if you could possibly give an argument for internalism, right? And how you think that theism somehow serves as like some conjunction in which internalism would even be possible. Um, so you, you wanted to make those three claims, right? And I'm investigating those one by one. So number one, that argument that I gave you for why atheism was logically possible was just due to the fact that theism is not a theorem of logic. The theism is not a theorem of logic. Therefore, atheism is logically possible. Second, it's just this question about how Christianity would solve the problem of the criterion. And third, um, it was about internalism, right? Those are the three main ones. Okay. All right. So uh, going to be going to try to honor the, the brevity request. I think that's a good request. Uh, I'm just going to lay on my hands, right? So I'll give you a characterization of what I think is going on between us um, epistemologically. And this is somewhat ending up in the dialectic. I think there was a lot of mere confusion about the role that naturalism was supposed to play in this conversation and why I was objecting to it. Uh, so let me answer your question first. Okay, the re so my construal of the problem of the criterion would be that it's very difficult to put forward some principle in virtue, which is an epistemic principle. That is, it's something we have cognitive access to. Some principle which, you know, to put it very loosely, puts together or makes epistemically compatible and, and expected items of knowledge and norms of knowledge. So it's very difficult on the one hand to have some kind of uh, uh, standard or criterion of justification or of beliefs or, or, or some condition of knowledge. And so a condition of knowledge in general, in virtue of that. Uh, and it's very difficult and uh, to be able to be justified in your beliefs about that without already having particular items of knowledge about uh, human experience and the world that we experience. On the other hand, it's very difficult to see how we could have knowledge about the horizon of our experience without first having some kind of uh, criteria that we are practicing obedience to, that we're, that we're in or out of accord with. And can and can construe our belief states that way. Uh, the way and so to me, the skeptic is is basically conceding the problem. The problem with skepticism is just that it's self-refuting. That look, if you take um, the solution of skepticism, you're basically drinking the poison. You've basically said I can't know anything. And of course, then how do you know <laughs> that anything I say is worthy of doubt? So I think that's going to be the the problem with your with your stance as a whole, as to how Christianity answers the problem. It's because the uh, personhood of God, this character who is the Father, sending the Son into the world to reveal the Father and send the Spirit, regenerating sinners so that they can have an experience of God this way. But this is not this. I can get into more, right? There's a lot more going on in that story. But just to give you some of the richness of that story, uh, that outlook on God, that person, is the main item of knowledge. And because God discloses himself this way, one has both an item of knowledge, that is the particular of Chisholm, and one has the method of knowledge that is, is aware in that act, in that transaction of the means of the transaction at the same time. They are coterminous. One and the same act provides me the criterion and the particular. That is not a kind of answer that is suitable to a lot. I would, I'm just putting this here for um, reasons why one might rule out naturalism or something else, right? 
Uh, the reason one will suspect naturalism of not doing a good job right away is because it doesn't have persons. It doesn't have agents. It doesn't have someone who's talking to you. It doesn't have someone who's sending their son. It doesn't have someone who can have human relationships in the first place. Agents, knowers, minds, they have all these various different properties. The claim of the naturalist is that, hey, pay no heed to the man behind the curtain. These properties really don't matter. We can just explain this with dispositions. Okay, that's philosophically fair game, but you need to show why on naturalism, we would have reasons to, to, to suspect that this dispositional account actually works. And when I, when I challenged that, no answer was given because quite frankly and historically, no answer is available. It's quite obvious that trees and rocks and other things are just different than agents merely by experiencing them. A child knows this. So uh, in summary, right, I think the problem is gonna be your challenges to me are not consistent with your own epistemological stance, which demonstrates that your epistemological stance is parasitic on the resolution to the problem of the criterion, which happens to be Christian theism. Um, well, a couple of things here. Number one, um, this is another ridiculous claim that skepticism is self-refuting. Um, the skeptic, I mean, if you're just talking about global skepticism, I think most serious global skeptics wouldn't say that they know um, that they have no knowledge or they know that you have no knowledge. Um, they could just merely claim that that's just a belief that they have. It's not something which they're justified in believing. So they're not patting themselves on the back epistemically when they say that there is no knowledge, right? They don't claim to know that. Um, and that's fine. If they don't claim to know that there is no knowledge, it's not self-refuting. So I don't know where you got that from. And second of all, you, you also made this claim about, um, you also made this claim about how my experience and how that experience that I have is going to inform me as to how I could discern and distinguish between things that are agents and things that are non-agents namely natural objects and things that have intentionality. Well, the problem with this view is you're is somehow assuming that under naturalism, um, we, we would expect that there would be little to no intentionality at all. In fact, if we're just going by some purely dispositional account, um, it's going to be the case that under my view, I couldn't explain or account for how I have knowledge if there is no intentionality to begin with, which if you're making that sort of um, act, if you're making that sort of move in this dialectical context, it just seems like the set of reasons that you've given are actually parasitic on what you think for some fabricated reason is the resolution to the problem of the criterion which is your view that somehow an intentional maximally great agent, right, with omni properties is somehow going to imbue me with knowledge that somehow that is some better reliable forming process, reliable belief forming process than the view that I just offered. I mean, um, Jimmy, I mean, I, I don't mean to be rude, but um, in most cases, when I appeal to my experience, and I observe the natural world, I mean, I don't know why you have to make this sort of like bold assertion that under naturalism, those things like intentionality, the way I um, account for how I come to form my beliefs in a reliable and justified way, if, they're, if those things are purely dispositional, they somehow um, conflict with agency and why should i look why can't the naturalist just say for example that those sort of agential properties that they're referring to emerge out of out of those natural properties like what what is the issue there there's just so many holes that i could pick through this and just say well the naturalist wouldn't grant that at all because under their thesis if they take some emergentist view, in fact, you would find agency under a dispositionalist account, right? Um, and lastly, 
you didn't really offer some sort of answer that, I mean, I guess you offered an answer, but your answer was tantamount as to what I was saying earlier. When what I'm looking for is like, what piece of independent corroboration do you have in order to explain how we have knowledge over the view that I just offered earlier, which was naturalism. And you didn't give any piece of independent corroboration, right? All you did was just repeat what your hypothesis was just designed to explain, right? The thing that has to be accounted for, which is just the datum here that we have knowledge. You wanted to appeal to stuff which the theistic view is, we would expect, would explain anyway. and. I mean, I gave the just so the same just so story, but for naturalism, replace all this talk about intentions with dispositions. And you didn't seem to offer any sort of argument against that, at least not a question begging one. So why should I think that your reasons being parasitic on your conclusions, right, is somehow going to solve, right, the problem of the criterion? It just, it appears like, we've reached the point of not only gibberish, we've reached the point of like insanity in this discussion. Yeah, a lot there. Um, so again, if we could like maybe break this down into smaller scoops. So, um, see, so I, one thing is, so I'll say two things to try to keep it short. One is I think this conversation mostly consists in me unraveling confusions about what a, reformed Christian epistemology, what a revelational epistemology is doing. So one um, expectation that I think is uh, mal uh, malformed and in fact fallacious is to expect me to provide independent corroboration. What would it mean for someone to satisfy some criterion of justification independent of that criterion of justification without which you can have no justification, right? That's just nonsense. The whole conversation is about the necessary and sufficient conditions. So if Christian revelation is necessary for knowledge, that is if knowing God according to how he's revealed himself in various ways according to the Bible is a necessary condition of knowing anything at all, and so that you can only know other things in virtue of knowing that, then it's just the case that it's it's uh, silly to offer independent corroboration. To offer independent corroboration is just to offer non-noetic, quote unquote, corroboration. It would just be to offer insanity, right? So it it again, the, I think the the weight, the onus that the atheists have is not is not being grasped. The onus is I need to show that one can have knowledge apart from the Christian theistic point of view about knowledge in order to then say that I know I'm an unbeliever. Because of course the Christian claim is, hey, everybody knows God. God has revealed himself to everybody. Everybody's guilty and can be held accountable for rejecting Jesus, right? So uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is just that um, for the sake of conversation, I don't know that this is true and it probably gets into weeds. I'm just not prepared to debate at the moment, but insofar as you don't think dispositionalism um, contradicts belief in some kind of robust idea of agents, then it's not really the relevant claim that I'm even calling into question, right? I was only calling into question dispositionalism insofar as it's a naturalist account of agents, right? So the claim in question is agents can emerge from natural phenomena. Okay, demonstrate that that's possible. Give me an example or give me some story about how the properties of natural phenomena bridge the gap to uh, a mental one. But like I said, I think that has been an obviously cracked, It's to use your terminology, it's a fabricated story. It's entirely made up, it's just so. That's um, remarkably not the case with Christian theism. First of all, because I didn't postulate this as an, as an hypothesis to explain something in my experience. I was told this as a historic uh, story that's pre-existed me for a long time. And if, if this is in fact the report of a divine being, then what would it even mean for it to be some cracked up hypothesis, right? No, it's, I'm just receiving something that's being told me. 
Right, but you would admit that it's still it's still in the domain of some sort of metaphysical story, right? And I asked you specifically, how is it going to be the case that you would even attain knowledge, right? You don't have to ask me any questions. I think that in the earlier part of the discussion, right, even if I granted you what you just said right now, that it would be nonsense to ask you for independent corroboration, I didn't offer any sort of independent corroboration at all, right? I pinpointed down how the initial conditions of natural reality had the causal disposition to imbue me with justified true beliefs, and that imbuing there is going to be cast out in terms of nomological necessity, right? And then you asked me the question of like, how is it the case that I would have some sort of epistemic privilege, right? to these things if those things are going to be sourced from things that are non-intentional, right? And then I asked you, well, why would I have any reasons to believe that if something is some non-intentional source, it still couldn't imbue me with knowledge, right? Just asking me questions isn't going to be like some sort of advantage that presumably theism is going to resolve. And number two, um, so you pose these objections to atheism, well, let me just examine your view, right? If I make the claim that I have a justified true belief over X, right, it is presumably, does that entail the truth of, of Christianity, right? Does the fact that I have a justified true belief, is that going to be logically entailed with um, Christian theism being the case? Because, I mean, I don't see how that would be the case. Um, and you also made this other claim that I'm trying to remember. You also made this claim about, well, um, the necessary and sufficient conditions for attaining knowledge is one of close, if we're going to examine closely as to how the atheist can account for how they have the necessary and sufficient conditions met for attaining knowledge, well, Again, like, I don't know why you're invoking talk of necessary and sufficient conditions. I laid out the process in which my view is only going to explain how natural properties are going to coincide with my mental apparatus, right? And in the causal relatum, it just happens to be the case that those natural properties imbue me with knowledge. How is this any different from you just making the claim from your fabricated view that some maximally great agent imbued me with knowledge. And you know this because of revelational epistemology. You know this because you want to make inferences about how the causal relatum works. And I'm just saying that I could do the same thing. What is the difference between you saying that, me posing the same view fabricated, right? But with talk about dispositions, like you never offered a symmetry breaker once in this discussion. And number two, all you did, I asked you specifically, um, how is it the case that the problem of the criterion, how that's going to entail that Christianity must be true because Christianity is the resolution for it. It didn't seem to give like an adequate answer. So at this point, I just seem like, I mean, either... I mean, there's some sort of like epistemic impoverishment on your part to understand exactly what my theory of knowledge is, or, uh, I mean, you can't do a worldview analysis between my view and yours. Yeah, so I'm somewhat repeating myself, but uh, so toward the entailment it, from the problem of the criterion, that's just that... Um, any any of the positions with respect to the problem of the criterion, even an attitude that someone bears who is not aware of philosophically sophisticated um, uh, formalizations of the problem, even somebody who's not aware of the problem, takes for granted that he has knowledge. Like, for example, when you make these knowledge claims about me being epistemically impoverished or to know that for some reason, um, the claim that nature has certain things that necessitate 
knowledge somehow is to present an explanation. I don't, I don't think that is. Uh, right. So yeah, I mean, there is no, uh, there is no alternative but to have knowledge, lest one be self-refuting. And so, given that the alternatives fail, right? The naturalist position that you're presenting, I just take to be a kind of particularism. You're just expecting that claims about the necessity of uh, abstract, unspecified entities in the universe we have no idea about magically privileges us to knowledge that they in fact explain the knowledge we have. Um, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that provides us with a criterion for one thing. And for another, I don't think that's even an explanation at all. It doesn't uh, privilege one over saying the exact opposite. Uh, now, with respect to your, your uh, theory of epistemology, my problem is, look, if you do take the skeptical um, route with the problem of the criterion, then you're just going to be parasitic on whatever does resolve that problem in order to know things like knowing things about my view. Well, that, but since my view, the Christian worldview, is the only one that resolves that problem, it's the only one we have available that explains our knowledge claims, that just means that your claims are parasitic on my view. I can grant you your claim about parasitism, right? But if I make the claim that whatever set of reasons that you've provided in this dialectical context are just going to be parasitic on the naturalist slash dispositionalist account. What is going to be the symmetry breaker between your, um, your accusation of parasitism on the naturalist and my, par my accusation of parasitism on you, the theist? The difference that I've provided is that on theism, on Christianity, we have a reason to believe that God explains those things. But on naturalism, there is no reason for me to expect that I have knowledge because of some natural phenomenon. No such account can be given. And it's not an, it's not an answer to that question to just ad hoc postulate that some unspecified entity necessitates knowledge. Because as long as the entity is unspecified, that's compatible with Christianity. And the whole goal is to show that there's something independent, something that can be differentiated with Christianity. In other words, to, to draw on something you said before, right? If there's an underdetermination problem, if, you, if your epistemology concedes that you are underdetermined about the necessary and sufficient conditions of knowledge, then you just can't make a justified claim about what they are, what they're like, what they could be on your epistemology. You have to know the distinct, exact conditions. Right. So, uh, well, I mean, I don't know about that latter part there, but let me just respond to the former part there. You want, you, you did exactly what I was accusing of you earlier, but um, it, it seems like now you, you want to say the difference is that under Christianity, there is some reason for why I should believe that I'm justified in holding to my beliefs. And this is because God uh, revealed this to us and he's a maximally great agent and he has all these omni properties and he is of, he is of maximal excellence and he is a specified entity under my view, whereas it appears like under my view, there's no such specified entity at all. Here's the problem with that, right? Um, you said earlier that you weren't going to take independent corroboration seriously. You weren't going to make some sort of like argument from which you could independently corroborate that you have knowledge over X, right? And so what you're doing here is, is just, you're just telling me, you're just referring to some maximally great being and then you want to postulate and to say, well, this maximally great being is omnipotent. It has the capacity to do anything that's logically possible. It's logically possible for that entity to reveal it to me that I have justified true beliefs. Therefore, an omnipotent being like that can imbue me with justified true beliefs, right? And 
supposing even that that's just a plausible account as to how you would gain knowledge, right? You wanted to point out to me that when I said um, I was giving some sort of like ad hoc reasoning for how I'd how I would attain knowledge under naturalism. Well, that's just exactly what you're doing right now. I'm just I'm just befuddled by the fact that you don't understand this. Look, if I say that God is the necessary precondition for intelligibility, the way I know this is because God revealed it to me and God has these causal powers to do so, right? And I, as a naturalist, just say that the initial conditions of natural reality, so it's not an entity per se, but we're just referring to some initial event, right? Nomologically speaking, right? That imbued me with knowledge. Okay, so we're both repeating the same claims that we've made under our system, right? It's just you can't adequately answer as to how the, there's going to be a symmetry breaker between your view and mine, right? Your intuition, I think, tells you that under naturalism, you wouldn't expect that we have a reliable belief forming process because those things are sourced from fallible non-intentional entities or events, right? Well, I mean, even presuming, even if I can grant you that, right? It's not like because theism happens to postulate some intentional entity that that's going to make the epistemic problems go, go away suddenly, at least without presenting some sort of like ad hoc reasoning, right? That you were accusing me of. Right, which you also fall victim to. Um, so, I mean, I've been very charitable to you. I've granted a lot that I wouldn't have granted other interlocutors, but I just don't see that you understand my fundamental point. This is why I wasn't being rude to you when I said that you were being epistemically impoverished as to how exactly you would know about my view without just, I mean, making some sort of accusation, which equally applies back to you. And you have failed to provide such symmetry breaker throughout this discussion. So it just appears like we're just talking past each other and there really just isn't much more to say. I mean, I'd be happy to go into other emergentist accounts as to how, I mean, you asked the earlier question, how agency, agential properties emerge out of natural properties. I can gladly get into that, but that isn't the main point. The main point is that I asked you several questions. You didn't respond to the argument as to how um, presumably atheism was going to be logically impossible. I gave you the argument and the argument was is that theism isn't a theorem of logic, right? So theorem isn't, uh, theism isn't a theorem of logic. It's not going to be the case that atheism is logically impossible. You never responded to that. Number two, you never responded to the issue of the problem of the criterion that I was raising. Like you never gave a sufficient reason as to why I should believe that Christianity is some resolution to that problem, right? And third, you never gave an argument for internalism. Those are the three things that I asked you for and you didn't deliver. Now, you may go on the mic if you want. I mean, I- Okay, all right. Yeah, so, I think you're right about one thing. I do think there's a lot of talking past each other. I, I'm sorry. So for one thing, for one thing, you don't have to apologize about sounding rude. I don't, I don't think you've been rude this entire discussion. Uh, we're, <laughs> both of us think that uh, the view of our interlocutor is a bit crazy. So I just take that as expected, and I, I'm not uh, offended by that whatsoever. If you think I'm epistemically impoverished, that's fine. It doesn't, doesn't bother me. We can shake hands and have a coffee. Um, I I think some of the talking past each other is a failure to recognize or understand possibly, but I think it's just a failure to recognize like the distinct the distinctives of Christian theology. So asking me, for example, over and over, what is the difference between this maximally great agent, which I'll repeat for the second time in this conversation, is conspicuously not the language I chose to use. Right. And I, I uh, said two things. I, I repeatedly brought out, hey, look, there's this triune being. His son comes into the world. We know this historical figure. We have documents about him. Um, there's a canon of books that has been safeguarded by 
this group of people who follow the word of the book, right? So there's all this various uh, richness that you can pull out of this concept. It seems to me that part of your rhetorical strategy, and I don't mean, to, I'm not accusing you of dishonesty, but I do think it's a rhetorical strategy, is to uh, flatten out your opponent's claim and not pay attention to the details they're offering, um, which does make it, would, if, if somebody's not paying attention to what I said, would make it sound like I'm not offering uh, uh, symmetry breakers, but I think I've, I've offered uh, two, right? So the two that I've offered repeatedly are one, look, insofar as this is supposed to be a pr provisional stance toward um, the vague belief that atheism is possible, that is insofar as we just beg the question and assume that atheism is possible, or as beg the question and assume that minds can come from matter, or beg the question and just assume that natural entities can replace God. If we, if we grant one miracle to the unbeliever and then let him to do a bunch of ad hoc explaining, yes, of course that works, but that's not what I'm doing. And that is one of the symmetry breakers. The difference is I'm not granting that my view is a provision for theism or something like that, right? The difference in our claims here is I want to say Christianity, Christian revelation, is epistemically necessary, and you want to make the claim that independence, mental or epistemic independence from that revelation is epistemically possible. Those are, those are both of the same uh, quality of claim. So like going way back in the conversation, I don't think parsimony is going to do anything to divide those two. We've both got an equal amount of groundwork to do there. But the difference is your claim isn't being justified in anything that you're saying. Theoretically, you could do that by just giving an account how what what these natural entities are, like the first conditions of the universe, um, and how they could, in theory, replace a person. But toward my second symmetry breaker, that persons are obviously different than natural phenomena, that's just the practice that you're uptaking in this conversation. You don't believe that you're talking to a tree right now. You're not confused about whether or not I'm a I'm a robot or I'm the first conditions of the universe. You take it to be obvious in order to inform all of the decisions you're making about this conversation. Like you, you wouldn't be afraid of being rude to a waterfall, right? Or a voice recording. So it just seems to me like your practice betrays that there's a great distinction to be made between what we expect and the explanatory roles that persons play in our decision-making, including about our belief-forming processes and including about what we think holds true about epistemology in general. And it is that practice that betrays, hey, you should be consistent about that when you think about what is ultimate for knowledge, when you think about the necessary and sufficient conditions of knowledge. Now that practice is consistent with Christianity. I don't see how it's consistent with naturalism because where you weren't confused about what a person is versus what a tree is before in our conversation, you are just seeming to forget the difference between what a person is and, and what, you know, rocks and trees and waterfalls and all that kind of stuff that we study in sciences when we go to talk about worldies. So I apologize for being long winded, but uh, it, last point real quick. Um, it seems to me that to try this attempt at retorsion to say that, look, I'm just not meeting my own demand. Oh, actually, let me interrupt myself. Let me interrupt myself. Because we have, I have limited time here, and I want to be fair. So I think you've accused me of being an internalist, and it, it kind of depends on how you conceive of internalism. I would think of my views more of a hybrid position on the internalist, ex, uh, externalist. Disagreement. Despite rising um, rates, ViStar Credit Union can help you save on a mortgage. Claims of what you're referring to as an internalist claim, but I don't think it's going to be relevant because I think it's rather. Um, I think it's for anybody who considers it, it's obvious that if you want to make the claim that you can know things, even though you do not know that Christian theism is true, and so you, you aren't a recipient of Christian revelation, you need just you need warrant for that claim. And that claim is a meta claim about epistemology. So while, you know, internalist uh, demands might not be fair of knowing that your coffee cup is this, that, or the other, they certainly become a problem for any kind of atheistic externalist view where he wants to make the meta claim about his own epistemology, that it's rational. Now he's got to do the hard work of defending that against Christians who are skeptical.
Uh, okay, guys, so we're at about an hour 40 here. Uh, how much time do each of you have left? Well, I, I told you five minutes. Okay, what, what about you, Jimmy? How much time do you have left? Uh, I, so I've got a little bit more time.